Hey everyone, welcome back to Bentonville 156, a Carolina's campaign virtual event. I'm Colby, the education coordinator here at Bentonville Battlefield, and today I'm so excited to introduce Chris Grimes, one of our great volunteers here at Bentonville Battlefield, and he's going to talk a little bit more about Civil War medicine and its impact here at the Battle of Bentonville and in the Harper House behind me. Chris is an expert on historical medicine and especially Civil War medicine, so I hope you enjoy this video. Reading from uh, Medical Director John Moore's report to, to General Sherman. The character of the wounds in the cases of those brought to the hospitals was of an unusually grave character, much of the firing being at short range. Of the 1,368 wounded brought to the hospitals, 131 died within 48 hours. There were 88 capital operations and cases brought to the hospitals between the Battle of Edenville and the Battle of Asia. And here we find ourselves in the Harper House. How did the Harper House come to be uh, as a hospital, a Union hospital, the 1st Division, 14th Corps Hospital? Well, the battle on March 19th was pretty fierce. The division hospitals had been established there, but were beginning to be pushed and overrun. So the hospital was moved, the men evacuated um, to here. And the Harpers, their world were turned upside down. So today we, we want to, to look at what the surgeons and what the patients endured here at Midland and at specifically at the Harper House. We're here the evening of March 19th. The 1st Division Hospital of the 14th Corps is moving in. Surgeons are instantly receiving wounded from the battlefield, specifically from the aid stations. Because remember, the, the aid stations as part of Jonathan Letter, Letterman, the, the former medical director of the Army of the Potomac, what he had kind of designed for, for the entire army, he laid out aid stations that would be really close to the line and then they would evaluate, or in our terminology, triage the wounded. So if you received a very minor wound, you would be bandaged there. And if it was a, 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 a wound that was pretty grave, as, as Surgeon Moore pointed out in his writings, he, they would be brought to the hospital. Once, once here, they would have further be further evaluated, those needing the most immediate care being taken care of first. Um, your surgeries would be going as quickly as possible. In fact, there are accounts here at Bentonville, they, as they removed the arm and the legs uh, of the wounded, they, they were thrown out the window, and, and actually a, a pile formed uh, of these, these limbs. Um, but they would be doing them fairly quickly. They'd be operating uh, to the point that they could drop an arm or a leg in about three minutes. Total operation about 15 minutes. Um, they were anesthetized. Chloroform and ether. Chloroform pretty much was what was here that we can tell from the historical record. Um, but there's very limited data on that. But from what I can tell, that that's what was used. Of course, chloroform inside a building that makes sense because it's not as volatile. They would be bringing the patients, putting them on makeshift tables. Uh, specifically in this room, I believe it was the dining room table. And they would put them on the table, they evaluate the patient, and they would begin practicing the brutal craft. We saw a total of 88 amputations between the injuries at the Battle of Aversboro and the, the actual battle here at Bentonville. Um, but a couple of key things I want you to, to think about. First of all, there's no fault of germ theory yet. We're, we're on the cusp of it, but we're not quite there yet. 
The other thing to think about is, regardless of what popular opinion is, 95% of the operations that were done during the Civil War were done under anesthesia. And, and we know from historical record that the majority of operations done at Bentonville were done under anesthesia. Uh, and that was important because it, it helped the patient in his recovery. He wasn't traumatized having to go through the removal of an arm or a leg due to the fact that he was just having to endure the pain. He wasn't given anything to drink. He, if, if he didn't have anesthesia, he'd be wide awake. Maybe given something to bite on, not a bullet. Bullets are, are apt to be swallowed. So those are some of the things that I want you to think about as we, we talk about some of the injuries here at the, the Harbor House. The, the staff did a study a number of years ago and looked at the actual, some of the actual wounds and some of the actual injuries that, that happened here. And one of the, the first ones that sticks out in my mind was that of Noah McCorkle. Noah McCorkle was with the 21st Wisconsin. And he was, when he came from the aid hospital to here, they discovered he had a gunshot wound and it was through the, the thorax, uh, the chest area. And another, another way I know that how he was responding was much like a, a giant sucking chest wound. And of course, once they discovered this and evaluated him, they found out there was really not a whole lot they could do for him. Another, another injury that was treated here was that of Marcus Bates, Lieutenant Marcus Bates. And Marcus Bates, 21st Michigan, um, had a bullet that went through his right hip and ended up in his scrotum. But what was the, 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 the mysterious thing was they didn't discover that bullet until he was transferred to another hospital. In fact, the initial evaluation of the, the surgeon was that he wasn't going to make it and that they shouldn't expend any energy or, or, or any care on toward him, just make him comfortable. But yet he was, he did recover enough to be transferred and they did locate the, the, uh, the bullet. Here's the other thing. Within two years, Marcus Bates was a father. So miraculously, that injury did, um, while looked pretty deadly, ended up he was able to recover from it. Uh, so that was that was one that pops into my mind. Um, Brigadier General uh, Benjamin Farring was actually treated here in the house. He had a bullet go through his right hand, his thumb, and he had uh, a couple of fingers amputated because of it. Um, Llewellyn Sutliff is an interesting one. He is uh, of the 21st Wisconsin of Corporal. And he was actually shot through the wrist. He managed to bandage his own wounds with his shirt sleeves, made it here, passes out, and when he awakens, he actually finds that they've treated him and they actually find the bullet in his pocket wrapped in a piece of blood-stained paper. We actually know that from his actual, his, his writings, his memoirs. Here we find ourselves in the parlor of the Harper House. And in this room, if you've noticed here below, we, we have a, a table that's been removed from its hinges and is... Uh, Put over two smaller tables, and this actually is of historical record. We know this happened. And here's a, a stretcher that has come fresh uh, from being uh, temporarily triaged outside and brought in. And the patient has been identified as one who needs to have his leg amputated. You would, uh, if the tourniquet has not been applied, you would apply the tourniquet, which we have here on the table, um, which it should have already been applied, but. It, depending on the situation, you don't know. Um, and the, pay, the surgeon, the clothing would be removed, the, and the leg of the pants. 
Um, he would look at the wound and typically measure hand's breadth above the joint or below the joint. Now, joint operation, joint amputations were during, during this period, but they still like to avoid the joint because those can be problematic as creating a flap or whatnot. But they would, he would ascertain where he's going to make his cut. Um, he would take, uh, he would start with, with a knife. Now, so many times in Hollywood, you see them starting with the saw. That's false. They would start with sharp knife, uh, particularly Liston knife, named for Robert Liston, the fastest knife in the West, uh, the fastest knife in the world at the time. Uh, and they would quickly do a circular cut or depending on the surgeon's pressions, what I like to refer to as a, uh, a fish mouth type uh, cut, but it, they would make their incisions, retract, pull back the, the, the layers, and expose the bone. Once the bone's exposed, at that point in time, they would introduce the saw and remove that appendage. After which, they would use either a tenaculum or a set of olive tip forceps and they would go in and pull out kind of extract the four to five major blood vessels expose those ends and then they would actually tie them off ligature them uh, using um, silk thread much like right here in front of us now one step i didn't go into was the how they would typically give chloroform to a patient it, actually, in many of your medical books, the easiest and quickest way to, to do this is to take a piece of cloth, make a cone out of it, and at the very top of it, you put a sponge. And then you would drape this over the patient's face and drip the chloroform into the sponge, allowing the patient to breathe in, and, and eventually it would succumb to the effects of the chloroform. Again, this operation from start to finish, stabilization-wise and everything, is estimated to be around 15 to 15 minutes. Reading again from Surgeon John Moore's report to General Sherman, every year's experience tends to prove the advantage of treating wounded men in tents where they can enjoy the ventilation of almost the open air. Uh, we're not in a tent at the moment, we're still in the Harper House. And of course, there's accounts the the officers recovering here in the house, but for the most part, all the men would be outside in tents. And Surgeon Moore is talking about open air and ventilation and how it aided into how the patients recovered. And this actually leads into a lot of things that were coming out of Europe. In, sp in specific mention should be um, the hospital designs. Our hospitals were being built in, uh, as a pavilion style hospital with lots of open air, lots of ventilation, and it was said to improve recovery and his report kind of backs that up. And here we would be changing bandages we would be inspecting wounds for um, infection. We would expect to see uh, some of the whitish colorous type, colorous liquid type pus drainage that we would refer to as vulnerable pus. However, we, become, we would become uh, a little concerned if we detected a a bloody yellowish pus that smelled something like uh, rancid almonds. It's through our training, through our experience, we, we, we know that that kind of pus indicates infection that is deadly uh, along the lines of, of gangrene and other infections. If those had been located and detected, you would cleanse the wounds and you would uh, using bromine and uh, or some other agent that would that we would know that that would be cleaning the wounds. Remember, no germ theory, so we're not 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 focusing on bacteria. And we'd be changing the smell of the wound. And this is we're still in the world of miasmas, where smell and 
air, bad air is, is part of our world. And it's our prim primarily where we look for in the causes of illnesses, disease, and infection. The only problem is because we didn't have a concept of germ theory, we were doing everything retroactively. It was where when we started well after the war, started using things proactively, that's when we started really seeing the development of antiseptic treatment, antiseptic surgery, that sort of thing. Here during the Civil War, we were doing everything kind of re reactively and retroactively. Um, you would also, you know, you, you'd stay, you, you're not only dealing with the, the typical surgery, the, the illnesses that are come from surgery, but you've also got to be careful of intermittent fevers, which is malaria, and it was endemic for our area because we live in an area surrounded by swamps and woods, and that would be one of our big problems. Um, another problem would be dysentery, and all driven by the food we're eating, the water we're taking in. Now, we would also be treating our wounded for pain. Our, our major painkiller would be morphine or other forms of opium. In fact, morphine, of course, is a derivative of opium. You would be issuing out opium pills. You would be giving drops of tincture of opium, which is where you have steeped um, the actual gum opium in grain alcohol. And that, uh, the grain alcohol separates the solids from the oils, and that oil is left. That's the medicine. You would also be giving morphine by mouth, injecting under the skin using hypodermic needles. Um, actually, probably more prevalent is where you would actually take a, a small scalpel, cut near where you want to deliver the pain medication, and actually squirting it just under the skin using just a, a glass syringe. All of this, we, with all of these type opiates, we'd be trying to help the patient recover, reduce his trauma. But one problem that came out of this was the, was the, the appearance, especially after the war, of what was called the soldier's disease. That being the, the addiction to morphine, the addiction to opiates. And interesting how it's come full circle and our world today is experiencing the same thing. The wounded here were pretty much removed, the Union wounded, by March 22nd. They were either transported to a temporary hospital located um, about 20 miles away from Goldsboro, uh, or they were sent to Newburgh. And from there, they were farmed out to those hospitals far north of New York, maybe Fort Monroe. But there was one thing that John Moore remarked in his report that overall, that he saw good medical care, he saw uh, good recovery uh, amongst those amputees, and he remarked that out of an army of 65,000 that marched from Georgia, that over that period of time, only about two percent were actually um, were actually under under the care of the hospital due to illness and disease. And he remarked how the fact that not being in garrison life, where you're more apt to get involved in various vices or to be lazy. that these men were relatively healthy. He, he, uh, he was actually, I think, very, rather pleased and very surprised at this. Especially if you think, you think back to 1862 and you think of medical care. Then, at the beginning of the war, and you see medical care in 1865, which is evidenced here at Bittenden and aftermath of the battle of it.
reading from surgeon and medical director John Moore's very report. The new system of ambulance organization has been more or less completely carried into effect in all the corps and has worked well. What he's referring to here is a, a piece of a, a new organization of the medical department of the Union Army that was brought about by Dr. Jonathan Lehman. And in medical circles, even today, it's referred to as the Letterman Plan. In this, when Jonathan Letterman took over, he took over, and he took over the medical department of the Army of the Potomac under the command of George McClellan, 1862. He walked into a situation where the department was in complete disarray. Part of this was due to the fact that supplies and ambulances were all under the direction of not the medical department, but the quartermaster department. He walked into a situation where you still had, you had issues where the regimental surgeons, and remember, regiments were by state for the most part, not United States regiments, but they were Pennsylvania men or they were Wisconsin men, or they were Michigan men. But there were instances in the early part of the war where wounded would be brought from one regiment into another regimental hospital, and that surgeon would turn that patient, the, the patient away. We actually hear in North Carolina, there are examples of is two battles, Battle of Newburn, Battle of Rhode Island, where this is actually happening. When Jonathan Letterman came in and said, we've got to change this, he established and took away, the, for the most part, the uh, battlefield operations from the regimental level. He brought it up to the division level. And he created, he, and that became the top, really top of your pyramid. And from there, you went to your field depots, aid stations, or we would call them triage stations. And so the wounded from the battlefield would be ev evacuated by trucks, trained stretcher bearers under not the quartermaster department's command, but under his command, would be brought to, to, to the field stations, field depots. They're evaluated. If it's minor wounds, they'd be bandaged, sent back to the regiment, sent back to the line. If they were major, if there were major issues that needed to be further taken care of, they would be loaded aboard ambulances, not under the command of the quartermaster department, but under the command of their own, which directly reported to the medical department, uh, the ambulance corps, and they would transfer them to the division level hospitals. And once it's the division level hospitals, they would be further evacuated, evaluated and then brought here, uh, brought in and, and taken care of. What you see here, this plan that I've just laid out with efficient ambulance, uh, with an efficient ambulance corps, with, with efficient operators in the proper places, with a, with a triage or an aid station or field depot there to evaluate who needs to be treated first. All of this is the brainchild of Jonathan Letterman. Now, Jonathan Letterman didn't think of all these pieces. These pieces were brought brought over from things that were observed in other wars in Europe. Um, probably the greatest, his greatest influence was a, 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 a French surgeon by the name of Dominique Larenne, uh, who's Napoleon surgeon, who designed the flying hospital and the flying ambulance, ambulance corps. And, and he got this idea from the French flying artillery. But it's Jonathan Letterman that put it all together. In fact, to drive home the, the ambulance corps idea, that was actually went to Congress and they passed an act that put this into place. So all these pieces began to, to meld together. It was at the Battle of Gettysburg that has been remarked within less than 72 hours, the wounded were off the field and they were being cared for in the hospitals. That's, he was actually, that's what he was looking for.
actually quicker than that. But that system was in place for the most part there. And that same system was in place here in, in Benville. And it worked efficiently and it saved many, many lives. So the next time that you're driving by an accident on the highway, take notice of what's going on, the ambulances and what they're doing with the, the people that have been injured. The very plan that they use is the Letterman plan. It survived that long. <laughs> In fact, we, uh, as Americans, after the Civil War, we forgot about it. Uh, more time, we, we didn't have a standing, a real standing army at the time, so everything was shrunk down after the war. And by the time we went into World War I, the Europeans were actually teaching us the Letterman plan. And of course, since really since the World Wars, we've had a standing army. And this plan is in full effect, even today.